Okay, welcome everyone to uh, today's class in the New Testament survey. Uh, would someone open us in prayer, please, before we begin? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for this time of study, Father. We pray that as we get into your word, Lord, your your Holy Spirit will minister to us, Father. And whatever we learn, Father, we will be able to retain the same and apply it in our lives. We, we pray for a blessing upon our entire faculty and upon all the students here in the Bible College. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you. So uh, I just uh, wanted to tell you all once again that the video was posted for Titus and Philemon. You don't necessarily have to have watched it before today's class because um, we finished both those books in that video. Um, but I've posted that. And I'm sorry, I know I was supposed to post on Friday, but had some technical issues. And so uh, it only went up yesterday. Um, also, at the end of last week's class, I think we were discussing um, something uh, from Psalm 119. And I had posted in class after that, but just to kind of uh, say it in class as well. Uh, so Aleph to Tav is the Hebrew alphabet, and Alpha to Gamma is the Greek alphabet. So in Psalm 119, uh, we see the the writer using Aleph to Tav uh, and using that in uh, poetry. Sorry, that was in our, uh, was it in our interpreting scripture class? Yeah, I think that was in interpreting scripture that we were discussing that. Uh, so I want to just bring that up as well. Uh, when we were talking about literary styles, yeah, in poetry. Okay, so let's just go into. Uh, the book of Hebrews, we'll look at that today. And um, we'll, I think we should be able to finish this one book today and we'll go on from there on Thursday. Okay. Okay, so um We'll begin with a little bit of background on the book of Hebrews. Uh, so we see throughout this book that uh, the writer is talking about falling away from the faith or uh, returning to the law. And uh, that is because it's written to a persecuted church. Uh, now, the persecution uh, may have been from the Jews or from Gentiles. We are not sure. There are a lot of uh, things about this letter that are not for certain. The author and the recipients are not for certain. So there are some things we uh, can conclude from how the book is written. Uh, but we don't know exactly where the recipients were. So we don't know whether the persecution was coming from Jews or Gentiles. Um, from the uh, Jews, it was because people were being thrown out of synagogue. So people who had chosen to follow Christ were no longer welcome in the synagogue. Uh, so uh, from that um, angle of persecution, there may have been a temptation among many of these believers to return to Judaism so that they could return to that community they had been a part of. So that's one aspect of the persecution. The, on the other hand, uh, persecution from the Gentiles came in the form of um, 
people in government because Judaism was recognized as uh, a valid religious faith. So the Jews worshipped only a single god, uh, whereas Greeks had multiple gods. And so they were willing to accept the Jewish faith because it had been around for so long. But now with Christianity coming in, it seemed like uh, a faith that uh, was a sect of the Jews. And so there was uh, not as much acceptance within the Roman world for uh, the Christian faith. And so there was a lot of persecution coming in from that uh, aspect, uh, that it was not a recognized religion of faith. Uh, because Jews were rejecting um, faith in the emperor and faith in all of these Greek gods. Uh, but because it had been around for so long, it was recognized as something that was acceptable, but Christianity was not. OK, so uh, these were the two sources, possible sources of persecution. Um, <clears throat> so we see the writer uh, both warning the audience so uh, he's talking a lot about how the Israelites had turned away from faith in God and so had faced judgment. And so he's warning uh, this uh, group of believers that he's writing to, to not follow the same things that the Israelites had done, to not turn away from God. Um, on the other hand, he's also writing to encourage them. So as we look through the book, we'll see that he is talking about how this new covenant in Christ is so much greater and has so much more glory, so much more promise, so much more security than the old covenant. So he's encouraging them not to be tempted to go back to the old covenant just for the sake of convenience. Uh, just to escape persecution. Instead, he is saying this covenant is so much greater and the glory that we have to look forward to is so much greater. So don't give up on your faith. So there's both the aspect of warning and encouragement in the letter. Um, so the reformers uh, used this book of Hebrews to come up with three major principles. So the first was no sacrifice by, but Calvary. So this is what Hebrews talks about, uh, that Christ is the only uh, valid sacrifice for the sins of people, comparing to the sacrifices of the Old Testament, where uh, animals had to be sacrificed daily for the sins of people and for the priests themselves. Christ was a once and for all sufficient sacrifice and is the only acceptable sacrifice for our sins. So this was one thing that the reformers taught. Uh, no priest but Christ. So uh, in comparison to the Old Testament priesthood, Christ is the only priest who is sinless and who has entered into the presence, very presence of God. Whereas the high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies, uh, Christ has gone to the throne room of God, and through Christ, we are welcomed into that same throne room. Okay, and so uh, no priest but Christ, and the last one, no confessional but the throne of grace. Um, and this is where uh, we see two aspects the throne, meaning that Jesus is in a place of authority, and so we as his followers share in that authority, and we can come to that place uh, of authority to Christ's authority and have confidence that the things we ask for will be accomplished, not only because he has authority, but he's also because there is grace in that place of authority. There's grace for our weakness. There's grace for uh, our sin when we repent. And so we can come with confidence to the throne of grace uh, with our prayers and believe that those prayers will be answered. So these were the three things that the reformers taught about based on the book of Hebrews. Uh, so like we said, we don't know for sure who the author of the book is. Uh, there have been various suggestions about who the possible author is. But some things that we do know is that whoever the author was, was quite um, educated because the Greek that's used in Hebrews is a very sophisticated level of Greek compared to the other books in the New Testament. Um, so the only other books that use the same level of Greek are Luke, Acts, and um, 
some of the general epistles uh, that were written. But the rest of the books use a much more uh, common person, um, kind of like the everyday language Greek, not the high level literary Greek that is used in Hebrews. Uh, it is also someone who was trained in rhetoric. So rhetoric was uh, a very important skill that was expected of people who uh, were teachers, people who spoke publicly. And so we can see that kind of skill coming in in the writing in uh, Hebrews. And also uh, uh, Hellenistic Jews. So a lot of the writing we see in Hebrews is influenced by Greek thought. And so we know that this Jew was somebody who was uh, influenced by the Greek culture, someone outside of uh, the main uh, part of, um, of Israel and of Syria and Palestine. So not from Jerusalem, uh, but someone who was in the Greek parts of the um, of the world at that time of the New Testament times, okay. And but it was definitely a Jew because they're talking a lot about Old Testament, comparing the Old Testament covenant with the New Covenant in Christ. Um, so, yeah, the suggestions for authors have been Paul, Apollos, Barnabas, Luke, Priscilla, Silas, lots of different uh, authors. Uh, most probably not Paul. Um, but uh, yeah, Luke, Barnabas, Silas, but also uh, in terms of style, it's quite different from Luke's writing. So Barnabas and Silas uh, seem to be some one or the other could have possibly been the writer. Um, so Origen uh, writes, whoever wrote the letter, uh, God only knows with certainty. So our focus is not on the author, but these are just some attempts to find, to figure out who the author could have been. Um, when this was written, so uh, most probably it was written before the destruction of the temple because we see in this book that there's a lot of mention of sacrifices that were continuing. Uh, so because we're comparing it to the Old Testament, the New Covenant to the Old Covenant, uh, he talks about the sacrifices of the priests and he says the priests are doing this. He's not saying the priests were doing this. And he also doesn't mention anything about the temple being destroyed. And we know that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. So this was written sometime before AD 70, but not much earlier because uh, we uh, have an account here of Luke being released from prison. Uh, and it's thought that Luke was put in prison during the time of Nero, which was um, between 64 to 68 AD. So this is sometime after 68 AD, but before 70 AD that the book was written. OK, so uh, the location of writing uh, is most probably uh, Italy. So if someone can just read for us uh, Hebrews 13.24. Thirteen twenty-four. Yeah. Hebrews chapter thirteen, verse twenty-four. Greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints, those from Italy, greet you. Okay. So uh, here we see that uh, the greetings are coming from those in Italy, and so uh, it's uh, most probably written from Italy. So the writer was there uh, at the time of writing. Uh, the recipients, so uh, we know they're Jewish Christians because there's so much mention of the Old Testament and no attempt on the writer's part to explain any of those things. It seems to be that he's writing to people who are very familiar with Old Testament practices. Um, but it's to Jewish Christians, not in general, Jewish Christians in a specific place because we see in Hebrews 13 that there's a mention of their leaders uh, that is repeated throughout that book. So it seems to be some group of leaders who were leading a certain group of Jewish Christians. 
um they were known by the writer personally so whoever was writing this knew the people that he was talking to he's not just writing to a general church audience uh, because he there's correction that he's bringing in uh, with a lot of authority he's talking about the struggles that they faced the persecution that they faced when they came to christ and he's also talking about their present struggles against sin so he knows what they are experiencing as believers and he's writing to their specific context so he's someone who's known by them who knows them personally and who's also respected by them um so we don't know the exact uh, locality of where these believers were uh, it may be in palestine because there's so much talk of temple worship uh, that is included um the spiritual condition like we talked about there was persecution so they may have been tempted to go back to uh, their previous faith in uh, so to follow judaism judaism rather than uh, to continue following christ so the theme main theme in hebrews uh, is jesus christ the great high priest uh, and let's just read that key verse hebrews 4:14 if someone can read that for us seeing then that we have a high great priest a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession okay so uh, some key words here that uh, we see throughout the book in hebrews is the great high priest okay jesus is a great high priest jesus has ascended into heaven um jesus the son of god and hold firmly to the faith so uh, four important things that this verse contains that hebrews talks a lot about okay so what are some uh, unique features of this book it quotes about 100 times from the old testament so we see that the old testament is very very uh, central to this book and it quotes from the septuagint so the septuagint was the greek translation of the old testament so it's quoting from the septuagint and uh, hebrews is actually a very prominent book in using of typology so like we talked about in our interpreting scripture class that uh, use of types right uh, is seen a lot in hebrews Uh, and it's a good example of how typology works uh, from old testament to fulfillment in the new testament um this is also god's final message to israel before the destruction of the temple because it's written right before that uh we see five warning passages uh that are included uh in this in this book um and they are related to abandoning the gospel and returning to the law uh so let's see if we have okay we may not be able to read all of them let's just read uh, chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 can i read sister uh yes please therefore we must uh, give the more honest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away for if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward how shall we escape if we reject so great a salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him God also bearing witness both uh, with signs and wonders with various miracles and gifts of the holy spirit according to his own will okay so in this first warning uh, we see uh, that the covenant is being compared to the law that was given by angels so um, as per jewish tradition the law had come through angels that god had sent to moses and this law was binding on the people of israel right so if they sinned against it there was severe judgment that they faced so 
it's saying how much greater is this new covenant that has come through one who is greater than the angels whom the angels serve right and it's come through christ so the consequences of turning away from this new covenant will be that much greater than the consequences of turning away from the old covenant um i think this projectors okay uh we'll also just look at chapter 3 verses 7 to 4 if someone can read that for us chapter 3 7 to 4 uh sorry chapter 3 okay that's a bit of a long passage okay let's not read it i'll just tell you uh what that talks about so chapter 3 verse 7 to chapter 4 verse 13 um talks about believing and obeying god's word uh that is essential in order for us to enter into the rest that was promised so comparing this to the israelites in the wilderness who disobeyed god and were not faithful to god and therefore did not enter the promised land okay so he is telling them uh if you do not walk in obedience to christ uh you also will not enter into this rest that is promised uh into the eternal rest that is promised in the presence of god uh so uh, basically saying that you are going to fall away from the faith you will not uh receive eternal life if you uh continue to disobey god uh then 511 to 620 encourages them to persevere in faith because god is a god who fulfills his promises and uses the example of abraham so whenever we see these warnings what is happening is it's giving them uh some warning or some encouragement and then comparing it to a story from the old testament so the first one we saw was the covenant uh, that came uh from the old covenant came through angels the new covenant has come through christ who is greater than the angels uh the second one is um the encouragement to stay obedient to the word of god and not fall away like the israelites fell away in the wilderness none of them entered the promised land that first generation of uh, israelites who left egypt uh the third one is to persevere in faith in the face of persecution because we believe in the promises of god we believe that he is a god who is faithful to his promises and the encouragement is to follow abraham's example abraham was one who believed and saw the god, uh, the promises of god fulfilled in his life um then the fourth one is chapter 10 verses 19 to 39 uh it talks about walking in holiness that you cannot continue in sin uh if you proclaim that you have faith in Christ um in the old testament those who did not walk in obedience to the law were put to death by the witness of two to three witnesses okay so two to three witnesses gave testimony and they were put to death uh how much more will be the judgment of people who do not walk in obedience to Christ in the new covenant okay so that's uh, uh because if you are continuing in sin so this is talking about continuing in sin not committing a single sin but being people who are consistently walking in disobedience to Christ uh, you are trampling over the body and blood of Christ that is you are treating Christ sacrifice as worthless and so the judgment for such kind of sin will be uh, so much more severe than sin under the old covenant okay chapter 12 verses 14 to 39 is a warning not to reject the gospel uh, because there is greater glory uh, and there's a greater promise of eternal um, eternal presence with god himself uh, and those who refuse that uh, will uh, will have greater consequences than those who refuse the old covenant or those who rejected the old covenant so the loss is much greater uh for people who reject the new covenant uh in hebrews 11 we see the whole list of people of faith so that is another unique feature of the book of hebrews uh we also see 
uh, that there are 13 statements uh, in Hebrews that are key themes, um, and they all begin with let us. Uh, so let's just read that, these 13 statements. Uh, so maybe, one, two, three, four, uh, Maybe our in-person students can read the 11, uh, the first 11, and then the last two, um, two online students can read. So we have these 13 let us statements in Hebrews that kind of highlight the key themes of Thank Hebrew. You let any of you come short of his glory. Oh, one. 11, 14, 16. OK, so we'll just start with our in-person students um, reading. I think there are 11 of us here. It's 11, the first 11, and then online, if two of you can read um, one each. You can see these 13 statements. Oh, this is not working. Uh. So it's Hebrews, Hebrews 4 1, Hebrews 4 1, Hebrews 4 11, Hebrews 4 14, 4 16, 6 1. 10.22. So you can you have the list with you. If you have your textbook, you can follow it from there as well. Yeah. Hebrew verse four, chapter four, verse one. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Thank you. Hebrews 4, 11. Let us therefore strive to enter the rest so that no one may fail by the same sort of disobedience. Thank you. Hebrews 4, 14. Can I read, sister? Uh, sure, sister. Saying then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our contention. Thank you. Four oh, sixteen. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Okay. Hebrew six one. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Hebrews 10.22 Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10 20. 23. Hebrews 10 23. Let us hold fast on the confession of our hope without wearing, for he who promised is faithful. Hebrews Hebrew 10 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Hebrews, <coughs> Hebrews Hebrew 12, 28. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And first, let us offer, offer the God 
acceptable worship with uh, revealing and away. Uh, 13 13 Hebrews 13 13 therefore lead us go fruit to him outside the come pressing is reproach And Hebrews thirteen fifteen. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Okay. So, uh, reading through these, we see um, these 13 statements in, as encouragements uh, to this church uh, so what are some of the main themes we see holding on to the promises of god so as to enter his rest uh, coming boldly to the throne of god um, holding on uh, growing mature growing in maturity of understanding um, holding tightly to the hope that we have uh, encouraging one another in the faith uh, uh, running with endurance in the faith, uh, face of persecution, uh, continuing to worship God, continuing to share in his suffering, uh, and then um, to remove all sin from our lives that will hinder our growth in, uh, in reaching the goal that God has set before us. So uh, we'll just uh, do a little bit of an uh, overview of what Hebrews talks about. Uh, since we've read so many of the verses already, uh, we won't go into too many verses in the outline. Uh, but the main things that we'll see throughout the book of Hebrews is that Christ is being elevated over other aspects of the Old Testament. So it begins with Christ is better than the prophets. Uh, in the introduction to the book of Hebrews, it says, uh, until now God had spoken to us through the prophets, but now God has spoken to us through his own son. Okay, so to say that all of the prophets were pointing to Jesus Christ, and now Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, has come and he has spoken to us. And so he is greater than all of the prophets that the Old Testament uh, has, or the all of the prophets that had written in the Old Testament. Uh, the second part is Christ is better. When it says better, we are talking about Christ being greater, so greater in power, greater in authority than the angels. Uh, it talks about uh, Christ being above the angels, that is the angels are servants of Christ in his divine nature and in his human nature for a little while he became lower, on, lower than the angels only to be elevated back to this place of authority. And so the angels are uh, are subservient to Christ himself. Uh, so let's, if someone can just read chapter 2, verses 9, the beginning of that verse. Chapter 2, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone, bringing many sons to glory. So in his human nature, Jesus was made a little lower than the angels, but now has returned to a place of authority over the angels. Uh, and so this covenant that comes to him is greater than the old covenant. Uh, in the third section, Christ is greater than Moses, right? So uh, comparing the glory of Moses to Christ himself, let's just read chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, the beginning of verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 5 to 6. And Moses indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant 
for a testimony of those things which would be spoken which would be spoken afterward but christ as a son over his own house whose house we are if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end okay so uh, we see here moses is described as a servant whereas christ is a christ is a son Christ is a son, okay, and so uh, for the Jews, the Mo uh, Moses was their greatest prophet, the one who received that whole covenant that established them as the people of God. And here the writer is saying Christ is much greater than Moses. Okay, so uh, all of that reverence that you have for Moses uh, should be. very very small in comparison to the reverence you have for christ um and then he also compares it to the rest so we talked about that the rest that is offered uh to the israelites was the promised land but uh in the new covenant our rest is in christ himself and christ offers a greater rest than the rest that was given to them in the old testament because this is a place of eternal rest in christ um in the next part christ is compared to aaron and the levitical priesthood uh, so christ is the better high priest um he is in a place of better position he is a high priest who has entered into the heavenly tabernacle versus the earthly tabernacle that we see in the old testament so that was just a copy of what is in heaven christ has entered into the presence of god himself and he serves as our high priest um a better order so uh, whereas in the old testament the levitical priesthood was based on ancestry right so only if you fell into uh this tribe of levites and you were part of that ancestry could you become a priest but christ's priesthood is not based on um his ancestry what is it based on what is christ's priesthood based, based on what's that melchizedek yeah so melchizedek was outside of the levitical priesthood right he was a priest who was before the levitical priesthood was established and so like melchizedek christ was appointed by god himself not based on his ancestry but based on a promise that god had given that you will be my son and you will serve as a priest for all people okay um <clears throat> then we also see a comparison in covenant let's just read chapter 8 verse 10 if someone can read that for us hebrew it was stated for this is the covenant that i will make with the house of israel after those days says the lord i will my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts and i will be their god and they shall be my people okay thank you so um here there is a comparison of the new covenant with the old covenant whereas the old covenant was a written law the new covenant is something that transforms the hearts and minds of people uh, that all people will know god and therefore will follow him so they are not going to follow just a list of rules and laws they are going to have a personal relationship with god and be transformed by that relationship and then walk in obedience to uh, the will of god uh, there's also a comparison of the sanctuary like we talked about so one is made with human hands and the other is the heavenly sanctuary that christ serves in um there's also a comparison of the sacrifice whereas in the old testament it's an animal that is sacrificed daily in this new covenant christ was sacrificed as the perfect perfect lamb of god 
and was a once and for all sacrifice that was accepted by God for the sins of all people uh, for all time. Um, so from here, after presenting all of this, he says, therefore, let's do all of these things. Because we know that this old covenant, uh, this new covenant is so much greater than the old covenant. The promises, the hope, the glory, all of that is so much greater than the old covenant. This is how we are to live uh, as a result of that. And so he talks about being faithful to God, enduring and continuing to have faith in God, even in the midst of persecution. Uh, he talks about then in chapter 11, the list of all those who were examples of faith. Uh, and then he uh, closes with the section on uh, persecution or suffering being a way of God allowing his children uh, to experience that for the sake of their uh, own growth. So talking about the father, uh, the fatherhood of God and his uh, discipline of his children. So even through this suffering, uh, there is a way of us growing in God as his children. And then chapter 13 closes uh, with a list of certain obligations. So social relationships, uh, spiritual obligations, specifically talking about submission to leaders, and then uh, personal obligations, and also closing with personal greetings. Um, so uh, that's a summary of the book of Hebrews. Uh, we will close with that and continue from there on Thursday, OK? So we'll go into the book of James, and um, we'll see how much of First and Second Peter, if we can cover all of that on Thursday. We'll look into that. Thank you all for being here. I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, sister. Thank you.